Late one night, Walter Goldman, a 55-year-old cab driver with a rich life experience in a quaint southern Tennessee town, responded to an urgent dispatch that led him beyond the urban boundaries. Previously a long-haul truck driver, Walter had switched to local cab driving to allocate more time for his family. He cherished the love he received from his wife Miranda, a nurse, and his son Spencer, a successful middle-class manager who had purchased his own house by age 30, on his route. Walter opted for a shortcut and was startled when his headlights caught the silhouette of a small girl, approximately five or six years old, by the roadside in the pitch-black night, temporarily blinded by the glare, she covered her eyes with her hands, Walter, concerned for her well-being, stopped the cab and cautiously approached her, puzzled over the presence of such a young child unattended at such a late hour, the timid. Seemingly frightened girl offered little explanation but handed Walter a tightly gripped note. As he read it, his face blanched in astonishment. The note contained a desperate call for help, explaining the girl's solitary situation and her urgent need to get to a safe place, while deliberately omitting specific details to maintain her privacy. Throughout his career, Walter was celebrated for his dependability and profound compassion qualities that garnered him respect both at the taxi service and in his community. Despite his wife Miranda's soft persuasions to retire and relax, Walter felt a profound bond with his job, relishing the engine's hum and the familiar grip of the steering wheel. He often humorously claimed that he and his Chevrolet were inseparable, a notion that Miranda found amusing, always ensuring he had tasty, homemade sandwiches wrapped in foil for his shifts, confronted with a dire situation. Walter's resolve was firm. He reassured the young girl of her safety and committed to driving her to the location indicated in the note. As they set off, Walter was filled with a blend of anxiety and resolve, aware that this shift was not just routine but a vital rescue mission in a child's life, emphasizing once again the unforeseen responsibilities that came with his role. Relieved, Walter guided the girl towards her grandmother's room, hopeful that they were on the right path. The emotional reunion between the girl and her grandmother was heartwarming. Tears flowed as Mrs. Jenkins embraced her granddaughter, expressing relief and gratitude towards Walter. She explained how a sudden worsening of her condition had forced her to send the girl to the hospital alone with a hastily written note, fearing she had no other choice. Walter, moved by the scene, quietly excused himself but not before Mrs. Jenkins thanked him profusely calling him a guardian angel. As he walked back to his cab, Walter felt a profound sense of fulfillment. This experience affirmed his decision not to abandon his job on the road just yet. It had given him a purpose beyond mere transport, a chance to make a meaningful difference in someone's life. When Walter mentioned the name Oprah Patterson, the young girl's face brightened with recognition, and she enthusiastically nodded, acknowledging the connection, feeling a sense of urgency. Walter and the girl quickly made their way to the room where Mrs. Patterson was recovering, filled with hope for a reunion yet anxious about the elderly woman's health. As if momentarily forgetting the pain in her own hand, the girl watched as the nurse paused briefly before asking Walter to step aside for a private discussion away from her. Mr. Goldman, I'm unsure how to convey this, but I must tell you that Oprah Patterson passed away three hours ago, the nurse said somberly. Taken aback by this sudden news, Walter struggled to keep his emotions under control. What am I supposed to do now? He whispered, his voice strained. After the initial shock subsided, Walter's thoughts turned to the well-being of the young girl in light of their recent loss. Upon closer inspection of the girl's hand, the nurse advised Mr. Goldman to take her to a pediatric trauma center. It appears she may have a fracture, but will need an x-ray to be sure, she noted softly comforting the girl by stroking her head. Since the girl could hardly stand on her own, Walter carried her to the car. When they arrived at the pediatric department, the doctors were taken aback by the x-ray results, which showed a broken arm and several bruised ribs. This confirmed to Mr. Goldman the need for her to be admitted to the hospital for continuous medical care. Later that night, an exhausted Walter returned home. Miranda greeted him at the door, her voice laden with worry. Honey. What happened? 
you look so pale, she asked, concerned, sitting down wearily, Walter shared the distressing events of the evening with his wife, Miranda listened closely, tears welling in her eyes as she took in the sad news about the girl who had lost her grandmother and sustained injuries all in the same day, it seems we need to support her, dear, I'll visit her tomorrow, Miranda said, her voice filled with hope as she gazed into her husband's eyes, her instinct was right. Echoing Walter's intentions, who was on the verge of making the same proposal, the following day, Mr. and Mrs. Goldman arrived at the hospital and were unexpectedly met with encouraging news from the attending doctor, actually, it turns out the girl isn't mute, it appears she was dealing with a psychological trauma that led to a speech impediment, while she's still quite reserved, the best news is that she has shared her name with us, it's Hannah, the doctor explained. Never taking his eyes off the hopeful expressions of the delighted couple, it's truly miraculous, when can we visit her, we've brought her some treats and toys, Miranda asked with renewed hope, buoyed by the good news, the pediatrician, smiling warmly, invited Mr. Goldman to see Hannah right away, he was overjoyed at the prospect, upon Mr. Goldman's arrival, Hannah, having eagerly anticipated his visit, erupted into joyful exclamations, yay! The driver's here, I missed you. Her voice was lively and filled the room, evoking strong emotions in Walter and Miranda, who accompanied Mr. Goldman. Tears welled up in their eyes as they too were moved to join in her joyful celebration. Hannah's joy was evident, particularly since Mr. Goldman and his wife had brought her some dolls that Miranda had carefully chosen earlier from a local toy store. From that moment on, the Goldmans made it their mission to visit Hannah frequently, often stopping by several times a day to spend time with her. Each visit seemed to lift Hannah's spirits, her eyes lighting up with joy whenever the Goldmans walked into her room. Meanwhile, Walter was focused on unraveling the events that had led to Hannah's circumstances, as well as those of her grandmother. He contacted the police, recounting the night he discovered Hannah alone by the roadside. As the investigation progressed, it was revealed that Hannah's grandmother, Oprah Patterson, had been her primary caregiver, Hannah's parents were battling a gambling addiction, lacked stable jobs, and frequently disappeared for days, prioritizing slot machines over their daughter. As a result, the family's finances were depleted on alcohol and settling numerous debts, spiraling into chaos, despite her own health issues. Oprah provided Hannah with all the love and care she could muster until her passing, Brenda's indifference, which manifested in her lack of interest in anything other than her next drink or bet, added a significant burden to Mrs. Patterson, who often provided shelter to Brenda and her husband due to their unstable, nomadic lifestyle. Brenda appeared unmoved by the difficulties faced by her daughter, leaving Hannah to care for her sick grandmother alone. The situation reached a heartbreaking climax when Oprah had a heart attack. In her final moments, she dialed for an ambulance but became unconscious shortly thereafter. At this crucial juncture, although Brenda was in the vicinity, she did nothing to assist, even as the emergency medical team attended to her mother. With her father in jail, Hannah recognized the gravity of her circumstances and made a courageous choice. One night, finding her mother incapacitated and asleep from drinking, Hannah decided to leave in search of a better, more supportive environment. This bold move into the unknown heralded a hopeful new beginning under the watchful eyes of the benevolent Goldmans. In the serene, almost deserted neighborhood, Hannah wandered down the empty streets, unsure of where she was headed. The absence of people around meant she had no one to turn to for directions or assistance. Eventually, Hannah arrived at an old, decrepit building. Its broken walls and smashed windows created an ominous atmosphere, suggesting it had been abandoned for many years. Despite this, a flickering light from the basement caught her attention through the bleak exterior. Driven by curiosity, she moved toward the building, but tripped on the decaying steps and fell. Luckily, her fall was cushioned by a man emerging from the basement just in time to catch her, despite his worn-out clothes and apparent homelessness. His kindness was immediately evident, he not only gave Hannah a comforting sandwich but also made some warm tea to calm her nerves, 
As they talked, Hannah noticed she had hurt her hand during the fall. The sight of her injury brought the man to tears, deeply empathizing with her situation. Once Hannah felt a bit better, the man wrote a note for her. This note would eventually end up with Walter Goldman, a taxi driver who would become a pivotal figure in her life. It was almost magical how the homeless man seemed to know precisely what Hannah needed, an indication of the silent connection shared by those who have endured great difficulties. With the note firmly in her grasp, Hannah continued her quest to find her grandmother, now with even greater resolve and determination. Upon hearing Hannah's plight, Walter, the taxi driver, was deeply moved to tears. He was confused and saddened by the cruel treatment Hannah had received from her mother. After recounting the whole story to his wife, Miranda, Walter looked at her, seeking affirmation for the thought that had simultaneously occurred to them both. Miranda, with tears in her eyes, expressed their shared wish to take Hannah in and offer her the love and security she deserved. With a profound bond and love between them, Walter and Miranda hugged, affirming their decision with a tender embrace, eventually. The Goodman smoothly went through the adoption procedures with social services and welcomed Hannah into their family. A few months later, Hannah was happily playing with Mr. Goldman's grandchildren, who had quickly accepted her as their own. Miranda and Walter sometimes reflected on their role in Hannah's life. Were they acting as parents, or more like grandparents? One thing was clear to them. They would love Hannah unconditionally for the rest of their lives. Indeed. The Goodman household had always held the belief that a happy family was characterized by the joyful laughter of children, a belief that was now more palpable in their home than ever before. After listening to this tale, what are your impressions? We'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. Your insights are valuable to us. Now, prepare for another engaging story as we proceed to the next one. The mood in the courtroom transformed as a petite young girl who could barely peek over the witness stand, entered, named Emily. She walked in, shyly covering her eyes with her hands, daunted by the multitude of faces looking her way. With tentative steps, she moved toward the judge, pausing momentarily as she steeled herself for the significant questions that awaited her. The matter at stake was deeply personal. Her adoptive father, who had recently lost custody, was applying to adopt her again. When Emily caught sight of the man in the courtroom, she was overwhelmed by emotions and started crying. It took a few moments before she could compose herself, and then the judge gently posed the pivotal question. Her heartfelt and sincere answer touched everyone in the room, pulling at their heartstrings. Those present at the hearing were deeply moved, finding it difficult to fathom the emotional depth of the situation. Many felt that this experience would forever change their views on life. The backstory of this case began when Thomas Clark, a 33-year-old who owned a regional chain of household appliance stores, met Helen, an 18-year-old student, at a contemporary art exhibition. The immediate and strong attraction between them was palpable, despite the age gap and the disapproval from Thomas's parents who were skeptical of the relationship. The couple quickly fell in love. Thomas, who had been thinking about marriage and starting a family, saw Helen as his perfect match. Ignoring his parents' repeated cautions that Helen might be more interested in his wealth, Thomas married her. They had a blissful honeymoon in Mexico and settled into their new life together, with Thomas believing he had found true happiness. As their first anniversary neared, Thomas brought up the idea of having children, a dream he had always cherished, initially hesitant due to her young age. Helen eventually agreed after Thomas's persistent persuasion, however. The couple faced difficulties conceiving, concerned. Thomas suggested consulting a doctor. The medical examinations delivered devastating news. The barrier to their family plans was Thomas's unexpected cancer diagnosis. This revelation struck Thomas hard, presenting him with a grim prognosis and an uncertain future. It was during these trying times that Helen's as Thomas's health began to decline, the true nature of Helen's character seemed to emerge. Her support for her husband diminished as he battled his illness. Casting doubt on her role as the caring spouse Thomas believed he had married, this shift in their relationship was at the heart of the unfolding courtroom drama, which would determine the future of a young girl and the true definition of family. 
Helen appeared indifferent to Thomas's suffering, showing little empathy or support as he faced his health challenges, rather than assisting him during this critical time. She neglected even the basic responsibility of getting him medical help. Choosing instead to spend her time on shopping trips and social gatherings with friends, despite Helen's lack of support, the medical team's dedication and expertise enabled Thomas to eventually defeat cancer after several months of treatment. However, the disease left him unable to have biological children, a fact that secretly relieved Helen who viewed childrearing as a drain on her time, finances, and youth, Thomas was deeply wounded by Helen's lack of engagement with their plight. A sadness evident in his expression that Helen couldn't ignore, when he expressed his wish to have children, Helen, with evident reluctance, suggested, well, if you really want children that badly, you could always adopt from the orphanage, although her tone softened, her disinterest in becoming a parent remained, Considering adoption a viable option, Thomas visited a local adoption center where he met Emily, a little girl with a sorrowful yet angelic demeanor. Emily had been mute since her arrival at the center a few weeks prior, a condition that deeply moved Thomas when he learned it was due to her past experiences of being forced to beg on the streets by her biological parents instead of being cared for in a loving home. Emily's withdrawn and quiet behavior was a likely result of her traumatic early experiences. Thomas was so touched by her story that he began to visit her nearly every day, initially. The center's staff was skeptical that Thomas would want to adopt a child with such a challenging background, but his consistent visits gradually built a bond of trust with Emily and earned the respect of the staff. Thomas spent considerable time engaging with Emily, playing with her on the playground, and bringing her small gifts, nurturing a connection that blossomed with each visit. This unique approach of therapy allowed Emily to gradually become more communicative and start viewing other children as her peers, a significant step in her social development. Thomas and Emily's relationship deepened to the point that he began to see her as his own daughter, after completing the necessary paperwork and getting the appropriate approvals. Thomas was able to adopt Emily, marking a new chapter in both of their lives filled with hope, from the moment Emily came into his life. Thomas felt a profound sense of parental joy and went to great lengths to ensure that she had everything needed for a fulfilling and healthy life. However, Thomas's wife, Helen, did not share his enthusiasm and lacked affection for Emily. At first, Helen hid her true feelings well, pretending to care for the girl. But as time went on and she saw the special attention Thomas gave Emily, Helen's emotions turned to jealousy and hostility. Helen also feared that Emily's presence might affect her financial security in the event of a divorce. Disputes between Thomas and Helen became frequent, with Helen accusing Thomas of neglecting her since Emily's arrival. In response to her accusations, Thomas stayed calm but firm indicating that Helen needed to change her attitude or they might indeed face divorce. After one particularly heated argument, Helen seemed to calm down outwardly, but she was secretly plotting her revenge. One night, driven by malice, Helen sneaked into Emily's bedroom with the intent to suffocate the girl with a pillow. Fortunately, Emily woke up just in time and screamed, alerting Thomas who quickly came to her rescue. Upon entering the room, he was shocked to find Helen with the pillow in her hands. In a desperate move, Helen started screaming loudly, hoping to attract the neighbor's attention and involve the police, which she succeeded in doing when the police arrived. Helen falsely accused Thomas of being the attacker. Luckily, Thomas had installed a camera in Emily's room for safety, a precaution that Helen was unaware of. Finished speaking, a wave of relief washed over Thomas, the judge, after a moment of contemplation, finally nodded in understanding, decision-making in these cases was never straightforward, but Emily's heartfelt words had clearly made an impact. The judge then addressed the court. Considering the emotional bond evident between Thomas and Emily, in her expressed desire to return to his care, I am inclined to revisit the custody arrangement. It is imperative that the best interests of the child be our guiding principle. This decision marked a turning point. The courtroom, previously tense, now buzzed with whispers of approval and sighs of relief. Thomas, 
who had faced numerous setbacks in his fight to regain custody, felt a resurgence of hope, the possibility of reuniting with Emily, which had once seemed a distant dream, now appeared within reach, as the proceedings drew to a close, the judge scheduled a follow-up hearing to finalize the details. Thomas and Emily exchanged a look of mutual affection and understanding, they were on the verge of restoring their family, this moment, pivotal in their lives, underscored the resilience of their bond, despite the challenges and legal obstacles, the enduring love and commitment they shared for each other had shown through, compelling everyone in the courtroom to acknowledge the profound connection between a father and his daughter, not bound by blood but by unwavering devotion, concluded. Thomas hurried over to her and swept her into a warm hug. That evening, Thomas and his beloved daughter went back home, eager to resume their happy life together, a future filled with hope and love. Do you have any thoughts after hearing the above two stories? We'd like to hear your thoughts. Tell us in the comments section. That's all for today's story. Please subscribe and give a thumb up. See you next time.